Good morning, and welcome to Rexo Alliance Church. My name is Cheryl Guinness, and I'm one of the pastors here. It's my joy to welcome you in the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We're so glad you've joined us today. Today, you can expect some worship, prayer, and teaching of the scriptures. And we would love for you to participate and follow along in whatever way you can. And please engage with us. Use the chat function or reach out to the main office if there's anything we can do for you and your family. We'd especially love to pray with you, so please let us know how we can do that. I want to bless you for, as you participate in the service and as you enjoy your week. God bless you. Take care. Hello, my name is Leanne, and on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you to this time of worship together. It's our prayer that as we mark this Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent, that you would encounter Jesus in a fresh and a new way. The Holy Spirit is always speaking, and we believe that he has a new word to speak to you today about Jesus. Today, we're going to focus our songs and our prayers and some scripture reading around the sweet name of Jesus, Messiah. Pastor TJ's last sermon series really helped to enlarge our understanding of that name, Messiah, and what it would have meant to the people who had long been awaiting the promised one. Some precious lyrics to me from the song we're about to sing is the line that says, Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. So I ask you today, what is the dear desire of your heart? If Jesus' kingdom were to come, what longing would you see fulfilled? What wrong would be turned to right? What's the prayer of your heart this morning for our world? our nation, our environment, for your friends and family, your school, your workplace, for our church community here, for your neighborhood community. So let's take all of these desires and longings to Jesus, our Messiah. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, holy God, you are here. Your Holy Spirit is with us. Holy God, mighty and strong one, abide in us. Holy God, incarnate and indwelling one, abide in us. Holy God, life-giving and guiding one, abide in us. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to be born as a baby, for living a sinless life and dying as a man to take care of our sin problem. Thank you that you rose again with power. You are on an eternal mission to reconcile the world to yourself. And we thank you that you have saved us from the penalty of our sin. Thank you that you're saving us now from the power of our sin in our lives this day. And thank you that one day when you come again, you will save us once and forever from the presence of sin in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. So together, we cry out to you, Jesus, born a refugee, friend of the poor, lover of the outcast, come among us. Christ, food for the hungry, health of the sick, savior of the world, come among us. Jesus, bringer of good news and the hope of us all, our dear Messiah, come among us. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. So join us now and together let's make much of our long expected Jesus.
So let's read these verses from Isaiah today, and let's listen to what he has to say about Messiah. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with her young. Amen. This is the word of the Lord.
precious promise a coming back again oh Hello, and welcome to Rexdale Alliance Church Online. My name is TJ Serchuk. I'm one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time or first time in a very long time with us, I want to especially welcome you. And if this is not your first time with us, I want to especially welcome you. I'm just really glad you've decided to tune in. I want to bring you a couple of announcements so you know what's going on before we jump into this morning's message and our first of a three-part Christmas series for this year's Christmas. First, uh, as a pastoral staff, we figured with the building closed pretty much for the pandemic, you can't come to us, so why don't we come to you? So what that means, don't worry, we're not stopping by. Uh, What that means is we are making little devotionals, uh, two or three minute video usually, that we're going to send out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every week for starting this past week, December 2nd through uh, December 23rd. So all of the Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays of December. You can get it on Instagram, on Facebook, on our pages, uh, or you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is just a great idea in general. And it will come to you. There will already, by the time you see this, there will already be a couple up. Hope that they are encouraging to you. So that's one. Second thing, the staff is doing something for Christmas. We are doing a door decorating contest. I tell you that for two reasons. First, uh, next week, I'll tell you where and how, but we're going to have pictures of all the different doors that have been decorated, and we're going to have a vote by the congregation about who decorated the best door. Um, Just something fun we're doing here at the church. And the second reason I'm telling you is because we want to invite you to do the same thing. Uh, Maybe you or one of your kids or somebody in your house or everybody in the house would take one of your interior doors decorate it, and then post a picture to our social media using the hashtag DazzleAdore. That was the name we came up with. So put a picture up, hashtag DazzleAdore. We will do the same. It'll be something that we can do to have a little bit of community and fun uh, during this festive season when everything is a little bit different, and that's okay, but this is something we can do. Third, on a uh, a little bit more serious note, um, Many of you have been very, very generous in your giving during this pandemic, and we are so thankful. God's been very faithful. You've been very faithful in providing for this church. Actually, our benevolent fund is, I believe it's at the highest it's ever been, definitely highest it's been in a long time, and we've been able to help a lot of people, and we continue to plan to continue to do so. That said, um, we are uh, behind where we would like to be, where we historically have been, and uh, especially... um, in our general ministry fund. That's the biggest fund by far. That's where all of the building and maintenance and utilities and staff salaries and all of that comes out of the ministry fund. So if you have just forgotten to give uh, and we're planning on it, if you are looking to make a charitable contribution before the end of the year, if you are excited about what God is doing here at Rexdale and he has laid it on your heart to give, would you please consider uh, supporting God's work here? And if it's all, if God's telling you to give to a specific project or a specific international worker, please do that. But if it's all the same to you, uh, the ministry fund is where we would allocate it if it were up to us. So thank you again. You guys have been so generous and we really appreciate that. And then as we uh, move forward, I do have one family news announcement. Uh, Ramona Loberg and Candice Pascal Van Elfen, I believe I got all four names in, um, they have let me know that they are stepping off of staff. So they're still going to be at the church. Uh, God's just moving them into a new season of life, but they have given their resignation and they will no longer be pastors here. So I wanted to let you know that it's um, just so that you are informed. And what we're going to do is in a few weeks, uh, we're actually going to hear from them. 
uh, through a video. So of what their plans are and what God has taught them. So stay tuned. Uh, they're still our friends. They're still going to be in the family. We're, we're going to still uh, let them have a role in our church because we love them and they have been great to work with. And I'm very disappointed, but I totally understand and support their decision. So anyway, those are just some of the announcements of what's going on. I want to start our series with a little thought exercise, a little illustration. I want you to imagine that we are not in the middle of a pandemic. Okay. So you are, it's Christmas time. So you go to a mall, you're walking down and I haven't actually been to many malls here in Toronto yet because I moved here with everything closed. But if it's anything like it is in Edmonton and Calgary, which I would assume it is, you're walking down the mall, you're very focused on your shopping list, and you see a table, a kiosk set up. And it's one of those like World Vision, Compassion Canada, one of those sponsor a child, especially at Christmas. And you can already see this person, they've got their eyes on you. They're going to interrupt your shopping. So you do what we all do, right? You pull at your phone and take a phone call that didn't come because you don't want to be interrupted. But while you're walking past you, you look down at the pictures and the weirdest thing happens. You see this picture of this little girl and she just like, somehow I know it doesn't make sense because it's a picture, but like, it's like your eyes meet and she just captures your heart and you put your phone away and you turn towards the table and you start walking and the person's like, hi, can I, and you're like that one, that one right there. I'll, I'll sponsor her. And they're like, okay, well, here's how, no, I, I know here's my credit card. Just like, I need to do this. And you, and you look at it and, and her name is actually Angel. And you're like, oh, that's perfect. Of course it is. So anyway, you go through all the paperwork, you sign everything, you uh, sign up for the auto withdrawals on your credit card. And you're just wrapping up. And you know, the person has explained to you about the introductory letter and how to, you know, introduce yourself and communicate with your sponsored child. Then they go, oh, wait, sorry, just a second. And they go and they type something into their computer and they, and then they come back and they say, yeah, okay, so I, I got to change a few things I just said. So this girl, her, her region just went under um, civil war. It's very dangerous, very bad time. As far as we know, she's safe. But all that means is all of our translators have been removed from the area. We can still get food in there. We can still get money. We can still get supplies. No problem. Like she'll be taken care of, but we can't communicate. So here's what we're asking people to do. In these situations, take a box, you know, like maybe something like this and put things inside this box that when your sponsored child opens it, they will get a better sense of who you are. Basically make yourself known by what you pack in the box. Okay. So I ask you, what do you put in your box? You're shipping it across the world. What are you going to put in there? If you're a reader, are you putting a book? If you're an athlete, are you putting like some of your sports, or, you know, a hockey puck, whatever in there? What's your plan? How are you going to make yourself known to somebody through what you ship? And would it not be so much better if you could just go visit this person and make yourself known that way? I use this example of a box and what you would put in it uh, just as a little thought exercise. And because it reminds me of a statement that I have uh, had kind of percolating this Christmas season. And I want to share it with you. And it's kind of the basis for this week and the next two. And that is... When God wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. Think about it. God, he's an eternal being. He has everything at his disposal. He spoke the world into existence. He could have written a book. We wrote a book about him. He didn't write a book. He could have written it in the sky. He could have uh, just spoken everybody here. Instead, when he wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. In a weird way, it sounds weird, but when God shipped God, he sent Jesus. With that as our backdrop, I want us to take our Bibles or your phone or your tablet or whatever you have and turn to John chapter one. John chapter one, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna grab a sip of my coffee and I encourage you to do the same. John chapter one. Our focus is gonna be verse 14, but I'm gonna start in chapter one, verse one, and read down to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Let me draw our attention as we get started to the words of chapter one, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, though who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, would you please open our eyes to see a true picture of you through the Word, the Word who became flesh. Make it clear to us what this means. Have your hand a blessing on this study in this time, in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. John 1.14 says the word became flesh. Who is this word? Well, to answer that, we actually go back to John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So this word is God. How do we get there? Well, actually, to understand that, we would go all the way back to the beginning of our story, to the beginning of our Bible, where we read in John or Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make mankind in our image in our own likeness. You see their God, who is one, is using plural. He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our own likeness. It's a plural word. This is a reference to the Trinity. God is a Trinity. He's one, but he's three, but he's one, but he's three, but he's one, but he's three. And it's a great mystery, uh, but it's very fundamental to our faith. That is what we're talking about. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. And here, God the Son, the Word, becomes flesh. And he comes among us. Now, when we come to a word like became, it says the word became flesh. You can become something through at least two different means. Number one, you can become, become something by ceasing to be something else. For example, in Genesis 19, Lot's wife became a pillar of salt by ceasing to be his wife, by ceasing to be human. The second way, though, is you can also become something without ceasing to be something else. You can become something through addition. For instance, when I got married, I became a husband without ceasing to be a man. This second example, the one through addition, this is what we're talking about. This is the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of the incarnation. God became flesh. He became a man without ceasing to be God. God became man while still being God. That is one of the many things that makes Christmas so special and so unique. And by becoming flesh, he was, he experienced limitations, some new limitations really for the first time. Uh, so for instance, God is an eternal being. He is outside of time. He created time and operates outside of it. And now because of his incarnation, because of taking on flesh, he experiences the limitations of space and time for the first time. And it, God, who was and is and is to come, the eternal being, suddenly has an earthly birth date. How does this happen? These are some of the limitations of the incarnation, God becoming flesh. Another limitation that we would see is that the eternal is now temporal and dwelling among us and with us. Now, this is kind of a spoiler alert because we're going to focus on that part of the verse next week. But but these limitations don't mean he ceased to be God. In fact, these limitations of space and time, what they did, they gave us a new backdrop in which, you know, through which to see the glories. That's why we come across uh, phrases like later in John 1.14 where it says, and we have seen his glory, the one and only of the Father. It's the backdrop, these new limitations. That's the backdrop that lets us to see him and his, his uh, glory more accurately. Now, if you think about it, 
the verse says, the word became flesh. Why flesh? Why not the word became man or the word took on a body? Why use this word flesh? I personally think after studying it out uh, that this was a very specific and strategic word choice by John. You see, when John wrote a couple of decades after Jesus had lived, died, risen again, and gone back to heaven, when John wrote his gospel, there was already a major heresy going on that he was combating. The heresy is Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, there's several elements, but one of the key elements is basically they view the world in a very dualistic way. There's the physical, which is bad, and there's the spiritual, which is good. And so part of Gnosticism, especially when talking about Jesus, is something called docetism. Docetism is the idea that God or Jesus was fully God, but he wasn't actually fully man. What we saw wasn't a real body like yours and mine. He had like an angel body, a spirit body type idea. Therefore, what this means is therefore his suffering, his experience, his death wasn't a real death. John is specifically attacking that head on by saying the word became flesh, real flesh, real bone, just like what's on your body. And so he was tired. And so his suffering physically hurt and his death was a literal death. And this all really, really matters because by taking on these limitations, by experiencing this, by having the suffering and the death that was real, he, he experienced what we can and he can be sympathetic. So what happened to those divine attributes if he's being limited to the physical ones? Well, he didn't lose them. He actually set them aside. He willingly gave them up. There's a theological word for this. The word is kenosis. It means self-emptying. He set it aside. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But this is important to us because this kenosis, it was necessary for him to set it aside, to take on human flesh, to live like a human, to die a human death and to rise bodily, that's important because that allows him to fulfill the mission of the incarnation. What is the mission of the incarnation? Well, simply put, he came to show us God. He came to show us the way to God because when God shipped God, he sent Jesus. When God wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. Now, as we talk about this concept of the word becoming flesh, God becoming man. There's many passages we could look at. For the sake of time, I want us to look at three. I want us to look at Galatians 4.4. 4. I want us to look at 1 Timothy 3.16. And I want us to look at a few passages or a few verses in Philippians 2. But let's start with Galatians 4.4, 4, where we read, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So here is God being born of a woman, born under the law. As we read these passages, notice the references to God taking on flesh. There was that one. As we flip over to 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we read, Beyond all question, the mystery from which great or true godliness springs up is great. And then here's the key. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up to glory. He appeared in the flesh. And then, again, if you have your Bibles or your tablet or your phone or whatever, flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I want to read and then spend a couple minutes in verse 5 down to verse 11, where Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we look at this passage in verse 6, we see that it says, Who being in very nature God. So Jesus is in his very nature God. 
Not like God, he is God. This reminds us of John 1, 1, where we see in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So Jesus is God. This is his very nature. And that changes things. He didn't strive for equality. He didn't push for something that wasn't his. He was in very nature God. But then he chose not to use it. It says here in verse six, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now compare that. Compare that back to our story, like our human story. All the way back in Genesis, how does it start? In the beginning, there was God. There was nothing. God creates it. He creates the Garden of Eden. He puts Adam and Eve in it. Chapter one, chapter two. Then we get to chapter three, where we see our story take a twist as Satan enters and tempts. And tempts them specifically with a few things. Yeah, it looks like eating fruit that they weren't supposed to. But really, it is about trying to replace God, trying to become like God, to be equals with God. Let's read Genesis chapter three, verses one to six. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit was fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Why do I go to Genesis after Philippians? Here's why. Philippians 2 verse 6 says, Jesus is in very nature, God. Go down to verse 8. It says, but he humbled himself. Now, this is really interesting because uh, we have the, the Greek word here for emptying himself is, uh, let me check my notes here. I wrote it down because I don't want to speak Greek that well. Echinosin. That's where we get the word kenosis, this self-emptying. So here, Jesus self empties. Then go to verse eight. It says he humbled himself. Again, when you get into the Greek, there's different like tenses and stuff for how a word can be. And one use says, I humble myself. Another use says, I was humbled. Somebody humbled me. I think it matters here that we acknowledge that the Greek word used is that Jesus humbled himself. So what's really going on here? Okay. Jesus is in very nature. He is God. Equality with God isn't something to be grasped. He already has it. But he also recognizes that this is not something that he should use for his own personal advantage. So he, he, he goes through the kenosis, the self-emptying, and he humbles himself and becomes like a human. Not going after his own personal gain, but going after the gain for humans. Contrast that. Satan comes to Adam and Eve and he tempts them. They're humans. They're not like God. He tempts them to strive for equality with God, to be like God. And they use their position of privilege in the garden with access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to grasp and to try to exalt themselves. How does he know this will be tempting? Because we read about Satan that he fell for this very reason. He was an angel in heaven, a very prominent angel. But it says that he said in his heart, I will be like the most high God. What is that? He said, I want equality with God. It's something to grasp. It's something to strain after, strive for, go after. So he exalted himself. When we go back to Philippians 2, it says that Jesus humbled himself. Go down a couple more verses and it says, therefore, God has exalted him. So you see what's going on here? Jesus humbled himself, so God exalted. Over here, Adam, Eve, Satan, they exalted themselves, so they were humbled. They tried to be like God for personal gain. So God humbled them. God in Jesus stopped being God for our gain. So God exalts him. That is what's going on. So when we see baby Jesus in the manger and sing silent night, it's not about that. It's about God taking on flesh, the word becoming flesh, him emptying himself and coming in. God self-emptying. Why? What was the purpose? Why would he do this? Because he is on the work 
of revelation. Jesus came to reveal things. What did he come to reveal? Well, we see, and if you just go back to John 1, 1 to 14, in verse 4, he came to reveal life. In verses 4 and 5, to reveal light. In verse 14, grace. In verse 14, truth. And then in verse 18, if we were to go a little further, to reveal God himself. What I'm saying is when God wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. So God self-empties himself in Jesus. He self-empties himself, takes on human flesh. This idea of God becoming human, as best I can tell from studying, this is unique to the Christian religion. This isn't in other religions. God becoming man, becoming human. That's Christian. It's the incarnation, God taking on flesh. This is the greatest revelation of God. Because once again, when, when God shipped God, or when God wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. So at Christmas, bring this back to the season, at Christmas, we remember the miracle of God humbling himself, becoming flesh, becoming man. Why? So that God could be known by man, and so that man could be made right, could be reconciled back to the Father. To make himself known, God sent Jesus. This is the greatest gift. So next week, as we continue this study, we're going to spend more time looking at this kenosis, this self-emptying, that second phrase. Because how does our verse go once again? It says, the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. What does that mean? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. We have seen it. And if we jumped over to 1 John 1, it says, that which we have seen with our eyes, which we have heard with our ears, which our hands have handled. This is crazy. Are you hearing this? God became flesh. We could, if we had lived in that time, we could walk around with God. We could handle him. We could see him. We could hear him. That's what it means that he took on flesh. But that's next week. So as we kind of step back, look around, Christmas trees, that kind of thing. Yes, this year is different, but this is a great time of the year. It's awesome. So many festivities. There's going to be concerts on TV, things to listen to, gifts, all the food, Christmas cookies, Christmas baking, all that stuff. It's great. Enjoy it. This is the time of year. But it's about more than that. It's not just about the festivities and the traditions and the uh, cards and the food. It's about God becoming man, about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Why? The miracle of the incarnation is that we can see God. The word became flesh. So what are our takeaways? What do we do with this? Well, two things. First, take some time to think about the fact that God revealed himself by becoming flesh. When God wanted to make himself known, he sent Jesus. So God becoming flesh was the revelation of God to us. So take some time Hopefully it's a little slower. We can't go anywhere anyway. Take some time and look at God through the lens of Jesus. That was the whole purpose of Christmas. That was the whole purpose of the incarnation. And then secondly, celebrate God wanting to be known by us. Take some time to celebrate that. Celebrate the word becoming flesh. So as we wrap up this message, uh, there's two things that we're going to do at this point. First, I'm going to ask, and it'll be all through video, obviously, but I'm going to ask uh, Candice to close our time in prayer, a prayer of blessing, a prayer of thanksgiving for uh, this Christmas season and everything it means. And then second, I would encourage you after that prayer, stick around because we're going to get to do another video of commissioning another one of our international workers. This one is Kevin and Val Hemp and their kids, Ellen and James. They just left this past week uh, for, let's see, I've, I was talking to them. Uh, so a 16 hour flight first, and then another four hours uh, over to Thailand where they are international workers. And uh, I got to say, they've been living next to me for the last three months and they've been great neighbors. Uh, it's a little quieter around there without Ellen and James. So if you guys are watching, Hamps, good to see you. I hope you hope the travels went well and the quarantine on that side is going well, but we're going to commission them. So stick around for that, but reach out to one another. Use the chat. Say Merry Christmas to somebody. Hope you're doing well. We're praying for you. Have a great week. Hello, everyone. I'm so grateful to the worship team and to TJ for leading us so beautifully through this time that has been set apart to reflect on, remember, and respond to the miracle of the Incarnation. 
born in the flesh to die in the flesh, Jesus the Messiah lives on by his spirit in your life and mine. And because of that, we find ourselves in fellowship, in friendship with God Almighty himself. C.S. Lewis once said, the Son of God became a man so that men could become sons of God. My blessing for us today is that we would ponder more deeply and embrace with greater certainty the new identity that was gifted to us at the moment of Jesus' birth, that we are his daughters and sons, fully reconciled to himself, reflecting his image, and called to make his name known to all people. Have a wonderful week. Hi there. We're uh, Kevin, Valerie, Alan, and James Hamp, and uh, we are privileged to uh, call Rexdale our, our home uh, church, and uh, yeah, just privileged to be able to share briefly and just say greetings. Um, I work for Youth for Christ Canada, also known as Youth Unlimited, uh, in the national office. And I have two, two hats. One is caring for our national and international staff uh, as a mental health professional speaking into that. And, um, and that is about 700, represents about 750 staff across Canada and around the world. And so that's a great privilege. And then Youth for Christ loans me to a center in Thailand called Cornerstone Counseling Foundation where I work with a multi-agency team of mental health professionals to serve international workers throughout the region. Last year, we served uh, uh, people from 40 youth, uh, international workers uh, from, from 40 or so nations, uh, representing uh, 140 different sending, where we'd, uh, yeah, sending agencies, I guess is what we would call them. So uh, we're heading back to Thailand uh, in one week, and uh, we're just covering your prayers for sustained health so we can get on the airplane and then throw out our transition and uh, yeah, just the adjustments to life. And uh, we just thank you so much for being behind us. Uh, Kevin and Valerie and your children, I'd like to uh, just uh, pray on behalf of Rexdale Lunch Church as we're sending you out. Um, and preface that with some comments. First, I'd like to read from portions of Psalm 86 because I'd like to pray through some of these. Uh, things that are mentioned here. Hear, O Lord, says the psalmist, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are kind and forgiving, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. For great is your love toward me. You are slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save your faithful one. Give me a sign of your goodness, for you, O Lord, have helped and comforted me. Let's pray. We come in the name of Jesus, that wonderful name that you have even invited us to use, because it talks to us of your power, of God's power in our lives, O Lord. And Lord, we come together gathered and we want to just ask you to guide and direct uh, Kevin and Valerie in their ministry as they go out. Now just like that psalm says, they are poor and needy and they need your presence in their lives. And I pray Lord that you will just come and surround them. I pray that you will just guide and direct them every step of the way. They're devoted to you. They're devoted to furthering your kingdom among the nations. And Lord, as, as that compassionate God who looks upon his servants, I pray that you will come and touch them with your love, with your mercy. Lord, grant them the wisdom and, and, and strength if they get tired to continue on and to, to know that you are guiding and directing them. 
I pray, Lord, that you will teach Kevin and Valerie your ways as they lift their souls to you, as they express their praise and desires to you. Their trust is only in you. There's nobody else that we as uh, believers can but trust you. And so they are trusting you. They need your wisdom as they serve uh, in, in kind of like an undergirding influence in the lives of other fellow believers and servants of Christ. So would you guide them in that and, and give them that wisdom that comes from above. Hear their prayers, Lord. As they ask you for that wisdom and walking with others in their faith journeys. So that the word of God might have a free course. And that uh, as uh, they share and, and under, undergird those who are working out in different areas of the world. That they will feel the presence of God. I pray that you will encourage Kevin and Valerie mm -hmm. along the way. Fill them with your joy in serving and granting them visible fruit for their labor and then just assist them as they provide that spiritual and mental support to the Christian workers in Thailand the surrounding countries Lord grant wisdom in Kevin's leadership roles at uh, Cornerstone and, and development coordinator for clinical staff Lord also for wisdom for Valerie in her office uh, work that she does so Lord as they go on the second. Will you sustain them? I pray, Lord, that you will uh, just keep them from COVID. Uh, in this part of in this time of the world, uh, when we're going through this pandemic, Lord, just keep them safe. Grant them health as they travel. Then they're going to be for those two weeks or so in, in, in that hotel. Keep them safe, Lord. Grant them physical, mental, and emotional, spiritual strength during those couple of weeks that they'll be there. Lord, I pray that you will provide finances for additional expenses because as they have to stay there, they have to find finance even to stay in that place, whatever that whole hotel is. So Lord, will you provide that? But then, Lord, we pray that you will just guide and direct them as they come back to the day-to-day -day, uh, work. For six months, then they've been away. And Lord, I pray that you will just guide them to know where to Continue from where they left off before. Grant them wisdom and strength as they continue providing that mental health care for international workers in that part of the world and other parts of the world. And we, we live in a time when, when you don't even have to be uh, in one particular place, but because of the, uh, the uh, being online, you can go elsewhere. And so, Lord, guide them as they deal with different uh, workers. Grant them financial pro provision for the Cornerstone uh, Counseling Ministry and, and, and so that all the donations will come in because the pandemic has done its work too, Lord. So when you do that, we just pray this all in the name of Jesus, knowing that you will continue to guide and direct them as you have in the past. So we put our trust in you and we commit them to you. And uh, we will wait with great expectation to hear Good reports of your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.